Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hooray, alleluia, and happy Easter. It is a true joy to welcome you to worship with us here with First Presbyterian Church of Vancouver, Washington, and this most joyful Sunday of the year. And so I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in, as we call one another together in the words printed in the bulletin. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, the Lord is risen. This is the good news that we have received in which we stand and in which we are saved. Alleluia, the Lord is risen. That Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed.
In the book of Lamentations, we read, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies, they never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Confident that God's love for us is steadfast. Confident that God is merciful. Let us confess our sin, first in unison and then in silence. Let us pray together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And here now we ask our silent prayers of confession. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ lived for us. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends in Christ. We are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's take a moment to pass the peace of Christ and other greetings to our neighbors. The peace of Christ be with you. Singing. They have been 
Especially to you young disciples and I just heard one of you and I see some of you as well and I know some others of you are watching on our live stream so welcome and happy Easter now I have a question for you have you ever been sort of sad about something but then you've had something unexpectedly wonderful happen like maybe you lost your favorite pencil but then a friend finds it and they give it back to you. Or maybe you have a test that you're not quite ready for, but then your teacher decides to make it a day later. So you end up with one more day to study. Or maybe it's the end of spring break, and as much as you like school, you still wish that it wasn't quite over. But then you wake up Monday morning and discover there's snow outside, <laughs> and school has been canceled. So you get one more day after all. That actually happened to some of you this last week, didn't it? Yeah, that was pretty exciting. So now this is all kind of what happened to the disciples at Easter too, only like times a thousand or maybe even a million. You might remember from last week that when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, there were lots of people who were really excited and glad to see him. And they welcomed him by waving palm branches and shouting, hooray, Hosanna. Do you remember that? Hosanna with our palm branches. But there were a lot of other people who were not happy to see Jesus. And they did not like what Jesus was saying and what he was doing. And they were jealous of all the attention he was getting. And in fact, they were so mad that they managed to get Jesus killed. That's what happened on Friday. And of course, the dis Jesus' friends were horrified by this. How could that happen? And they were scared. Would the bad guys come after them too? And of course, they were sad. Very, very sad. Jesus, who was their best friend, was dead. But on Easter morning, when some of the women disciples went to the tomb, they discovered that Jesus' body was gone. At first, they didn't quite know what that meant. But as they were standing there thinking about it and trying to figure out what would happen, two angels appeared next to them, and they told them that Jesus had risen, that he had come back to life. Jesus was alive again. And they were so happy. They were so happy and they ran to tell the other disciples too. Now, we don't really quite understand how this happened. People who are dead do not usually come back to life. So this was a mystery and it's a miracle, but it shows us that nothing, nothing, not even death can stop God. So we can be really happy and thankful for that too. 
And so let's give thanks to God by praying. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are so glad that you are alive. Help us remember that even when things look scary or sad, like it did for the disciples before Easter, we can trust that you are looking out for us too. Help us remember that no matter what happens, you are with us and that you love us and that you will always take care of us. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to hear the good news, let us pray. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. Amen. On Good Friday, we remembered the death of Jesus with the help of several readings from the Gospel of Luke. The last reading on Good Friday told the story of a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, Saturday, they rested according to the commandment. Now it's Sunday. Jesus has died and been buried, and a silent Saturday has passed. It would seem that the story of Jesus has come to an end. Death is the end of life, right? But wait. There's a but. The story continues with a but. But on the first day of the week, Sunday, at early dawn, they came to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, Suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day, rise again. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up, and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, at sunrise, raise your hand if you've ever attended an Easter sunrise service. Many hands in the air, lots of hands. Raise your hand if you remember attending this church's Easter sunrise services across the street at Kiggins Bowl. A few, a few <laughs> hands do remember those days. It's been a long time since those services were held. Sunrise services go all the way back to the first Easter. I have fond childhood memories of attending them on the beach in California. But my favorite Easter sunrise service came a bit later when I was in college at the University of Colorado. The service was held at Red Rocks Amphitheater, one of the most famous concert venues 
in the world. I had been to some great concerts there, including Paul Simon and Sting. Raise your hand if you've ever seen Paul Simon or Sting in concert. Several hands. Excellent. Now imagine hearing them in a beautiful outdoor venue with unsurpassed acoustics. Amazing shows. But even better, even more amazing than Paul Simon and Sting was Easter Sunday at Red Rocks with the sun rising, rays of light brightening the sky and warming our bodies. And the sound. This morning, we get to hear our triumphant Easter hymns with the help of a pipe organ and brass in a worship space with excellent acoustics. That morning at Red Rocks, our songs celebrating Christ's victory over death were at least as majestic. The stones were alive with the sound. The sermon was less memorable. (laughs) But I do remember one word from it, a word that was used as a repeated refrain. Repeatedly, the preacher proclaimed, surprise, whatever else the Easter story is, it is surprising. Most obviously, the resurrection of Christ is a surprise. His mourners expect to find his body. Instead, they find an empty tomb. When I revisited Luke's telling of this story the past few days, I noted a number of details that would surprise people hearing the story for the first time, and that might still surprise us today. One surprise is who finds the tomb of Jesus empty. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women. All four Gospels record that women were the first to find the empty tomb. They were the first reporters of the resurrection. This is not an incidental detail. It's included despite the fact that it invited skepticism. Women were often considered unreliable witnesses in the patriarchal culture of the first century Mediterranean world. Since Christmas Eve, we have heard Luke challenge his culture by repeatedly centering women, beginning with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and continuing through today's text. About the importance of noticing this part of the Easter story, Murray Pura writes, The story of Jesus begins with angels and ends with angels. But at the resurrection, it is not a cluster of shepherds who see them, but a cluster of women. There is something in the fact that people had little trouble believing that the rough and ready shepherds really had seen something extraordinary. People were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But when it comes to the women spreading the word about what had been told them, Also by angels, no one is amazed, except perhaps amazed that such a fantastic tale could have emerged full-blown from apparently overactive or grief-shattered imaginations. Stereotypes about people, whether based on gender, race, language, or religion, always blind us to what God is actually doing in the world. A second surprise in Luke's telling of the resurrection story is Peter, the follower of Jesus, who has been consistently blind to what God is doing. Peter gets only a brief mention here. Still, it gets our attention. After hearing the report of the women, Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. Peter was not merely a disciple, a student apprentice of Jesus. Along with James and John, Peter was in the inner circle of the disciples. He was a close friend of Jesus. 
Yet, again and again, he misunderstood his teacher. Again and again, he put his foot in his mouth. Again and again, he jumped to the wrong conclusions. And his crowning act of misdiscipleship was to deny even knowing Jesus as his friend faced torture and death. So, we might be surprised that Peter is the one disciple who is at least willing to hope that the report of the resurrection is true. Then again, maybe Peter is the most likely disciple to hope that Christ has risen. Who would long more for a second chance with Jesus than Peter? Whatever else the resurrection means, for Peter, it meant the possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration. And it is the resurrection, of course, that is the greatest surprise of the story we remember this morning. After all, when people die, they tend to stay dead. When we reflect on the resurrection, it's easy to get buried in speculation about what happened. But a better question is this. Why does it matter? William Placker explains. What happened? We do not have enough evidence for a confident answer of any kind based purely on historical evidence. It is equally the case that most Christians who start arguing for a historical basis for faith quickly start claiming more than they can know. It is only when our minds and hearts have been captured by the Jesus we meet, whether we meet him in the stories that describe him, in the life of the church that worships him, or in some other way, that we will be persuaded that the resurrection narratives point to the reality that after his death, he yet lived. And we will in turn find the stories of Jesus persuasive only as they illumine our understanding of the world and how we should live our lives. We cannot separate asking what happened from asking what does it mean? What does it mean? for the way we understand the world, and for the way we live our lives. What does the resurrection mean for the way we understand the world and for the way we live our lives? Shorter version, why does it matter? The resurrection invites us to join with Peter in seeing the world as a place of possibilities and opportunities. The resurrection promises that no matter how far we journey, even through the valley of the shadow of death, we are never beyond God's gracious care. The resurrection reveals that new beginnings, and new life, reconciliation and restoration are only a stone's roll away. The resurrection also illumines the way of life that pleases God. Joel Green writes, Jesus' resurrection and ascension constitute God's vindication of Jesus' life, his identity, and the nature of his ministry. The resurrection is God's stamp of approval on the teaching and example of Jesus, on what he said and did. The resurrection shows us that the way of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is the way to live. And it's a life that will never end. Because death is not the end of the story. Death 
does not get the last word. The last word is the word made flesh, Christ Jesus, and Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we proclaim our faith together with the words from our affirmation of faith. Um, I encourage you to use the version that is shown on the screen as we have discovered an error in the version printed in the bulletin. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God preaching good news to the poor and release to, to the, the captives, captives. Teaching, teaching by, by word, word and, and deed, and, and blessing the children, the children healing, healing the, sick, the sick, and binding, binding up, up the, the brokenhearted, brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, outcasts forgiving, forgiving sinners, sinners and, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly, unjustly condemned, condemned for blasphemy and sedition, and sedition Jesus, Jesus was crucified Suffering, suffering the, the depths of, of human pain, pain and, giving and giving his, his life for, for the sins, sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking Seen the power of sin, of sin and evil, and delivering us from, from death, death to life, life eternal. eternal. Amen. may be seated. In the spirit of the first believers, we are called to share our goods in common and contribute to the needs of the vulnerable with glad and generous hearts. You may offer your gift by placing it in the box as you exit this morning, or you may give online or by mail. Let us give to God's ongoing and life-giving work generously.
Let us pray. Gracious God, keep us working and praying for the coming of your universal restoration when we will share abundant life with you. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. We will come from north and south and east and west, from every nation, every race, and every walk of life to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. It was at the table and in the breaking of the bread that the disciples first recognized the living presence of the risen Christ in their midst. And it is at this table that we meet Christ again and again. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all who humbly put their trust in him to come and share in the feast that he has prepared. Let us give thanks. Let us pray. In every time and every age, O oh God, it is good and faithful that we give you thanks. For your mercy is sure and your steadfast love endures forever. In your compassion, you gave us Christ Jesus, who sets us free from death and leads us to life eternal. And so with all creation, with all the needy and hungry ones, with all those who have enough and plenty, with creatures large and small, with sun and moon and stars, and with the saints of every age, we praise your name. Blessed are you, O God, creator of all things. By your power and love, you continue to deliver your people from bondage, thwart the designs of evil, show the way through the wilderness, turn hardship into righteousness, and reveal your hand upholding the just. Blessed are you, O Christ, servant of the universe. You came among us to feed and heal and teach, to confound the proud to confuse the deceivers, to challenge the wrong-hearted, and in all these things, to give hope to those who long for peace. Blessed are you, O Spirit, giver of life. You give us words when we have none. You fill us with vision when we have the most need. You give us voice to proclaim our faith in every hour. Be our guide and teacher today and always. Come now, O Prince of Peace, Spirit of Love, Breath of Life. Bring to all this hurting world the joy that Mary knew, and teach us to proclaim with her, I have seen the Lord. In the unity of the Holy Trinity, in gratitude for the resurrection, we praise you, God of all that is, now and forevermore. Amen. When we gather at this table, we remember how, on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup. saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it. Friends, every time that we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Let us share in this feast together.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that by the witness of your word and the sharing of this meal, you have opened our hearts and eyes to the presence of Christ among us. Now send us forth from this place by the power of your spirit to tell the good news to the world. The Lord has risen indeed. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit for our closing hymn. As you leave this place, may the living Lord go with you. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, beneath you to lift you up, above you to watch over you, within you to help you walk with faith, hope, and love, and always before you to show you the way. Amen.